Welcome to Truth Sentinel, watching over the truth in the news. Hello to everyone, a very warm welcome. This is Truth Sentinel, my name's Scott, and let me tell you a little bit about our show. We do weekly podcast shows covering topics connected to psychology, philosophy, political corruption, cover-ups, conspiracies, mysteries world events, science and more. Um, We've covered topics like logical thinking, the psychology of fear, cryptozoology, MH370 and missing planes, honor killings, conspiracy theories, Egyptian pyramids, human head transplants and recently forensics. We've had guests like um, Sean Stone, uh, son of Oliver Stone, Sarah Chu from The Innocence Project, uh, CNN's Jeff Wise, um, refugee activist Gabriela Andreevska, Sheila Zielinski, Gareth Ike, Brian Forster, L.A. Marzuli, Rosemary Ellen Guiley, Douglas Dietrich, etc. I broadcast while on the move, sometimes uh, relating the location to the show's topics. Currently I'm in uh, Koh Samui, Thailand, um, an island in the southeast of Thailand. Very warm, nice beaches. I recommend it to anyone uh, if you get the chance to come and visit. A uh, quick shout out to all those listeners on Dark Matter Digital Network. Also people listening on YouTube. It's nice to have you with us. So today we're going to talk about news articles. And remember you can um, you can leave um, comments in the chat box on our website at www.truthsentinel.co.uk. You can also leave voicemails there and we can put them on the show and respond to them. So that's www.truthsentinel.co.uk. So I'm going to be joined by Anthony Kay and Philip Gardner. Um, Philip uh, is in Portugal and Anthony is in Kazakhstan, as you know. Let's go over to them now. Anthony and Phil, it's, uh, it's always great to have you both, um, both with us on uh, Truth Sentinel. Welcome back to both of you. And uh, we're going to have a, one of our discussion chats where we talk about anything and everything. So um, first of all, hello to both of you. Hi there. Hello. So first of all, anyway, I thought we'd, we'd, we'd go to Phil, who's got, um, who's got an article which we know nothing about almost. Um, I, I just know that it's uh, something to do with a theory of life and involves Darwin and evolution. Yeah, so I, I came across this article in the HuffingtonPost.com, and uh, it's, it's a, an interview with a guy called Nigel Goldenfeld, who's a British-born theoretical physicist. Sounds like a James Bond villain to me. He does, doesn't he? Yeah, you can just imagine him with the, the, the fluffy white cap on his lap saying we need a theory of life. So this kind of stuck out in, in my mind because um, we still haven't got a, a complete theory of uh, life and evolution. Um, now, Golden Feltz, this theoretical physicist, as I said, who's been awarded numerous times for his work in the field. And he's interested in developing a, a kind of complete theory, just as uh, Einstein, for example, wanted to develop a, a complete theory of the universe that um, that brought together the theory of gra- gravity and relativity and, and so on. Now, Darwin famously wrote that evolution in life is a pretty violent affair, the survival of the fittest to pass on their DNA to their offspring. Uh, Jean-Baptiste Lamarck um, was famous for his theory of inheritance of acquired characteristics. So, for example, if an organism changes during life in order to adapt to its environment, those changes are passed on to its offspring. But uh, Darwin himself wrote in um, near the end of some of his works that he may be wrong in his theory of evolution and that nature is not always such an aggressive competition. Um, and we come into sort of what uh, some of the theories that are going around nowadays, um, like epigenetics, for example, the study of changes in organisms caused by modifications of gene expression rather than an alteration of the genetic code itself. Are you trying to sound intelligent, Phil? I, I, I was just about to say that this all sounds like lots of big words and, and stuff that I don't fully understand myself. But uh, what interested me is that this guy is interested in finding a, a complete theory of, of life. Um, because it's interesting because we don't have one. We've been alive for a long time, uh, or human beings have been alive for a long time, and uh, and we still don't really understand our own life, what life is. I hope it isn't survival of the fittest because um, I've got some serious work to do. <laughs> 
So you're still panting when you're running around in the ring, in the boxing yeah, ring. Yeah, yeah, I've been doing the Thai boxing, and um, it's hard work, that's all I can say, and uh, there's lots of work to be done, but I'm um, sorry, please continue. So I'll try to be fairly brief with this, because there's a lot of information there, but um, basically a guy called Carl Woese and Goldenfeld put forward a, a perspective whereby, and I'm quoting here, life is inherently self-referential. In other words, it's like a computer program which can constantly overwrite the program itself as it runs. The notion that program is the data and the data is the program, the idea that life has a dynamics where the rules that govern life are themselves changed by the rules, that's self-referentiality. And that's basically saying in, in a more basic terms, uh, that's basically saying that, um, that life is not fixed that our universe is not a fixed sort of machine, that it changes as we place rules on it, as we place theories on it. Basically, it's, it's like, um, it's like some, some of the, the old scientific uh, kind of quotations where someone sort of says, uh, the observer changes the experiment just through his observation. That was like in uh, Schrodinger's um, cat, I think that was. I don't know anything about Schrodinger's cat, what happened there. Oh, uh, I think he had the theory that the, a cat could be in a box and with with some poison, and uh, until you open the lid of the box, you don't know whether the cat's alive or dead, and so it's actually both at the same time until the observer observes it. Something like that, right, Anthony? Yeah, that's right. It's about it's about um, probability waves, and it relates to the positions of um, electrons in an atom. You can't actually um, say where an electron is going to be at any particular time. You can't you can't predict it. Um, until you actually observe it. And so his, his cat thing was a sort of thought experiment to help to clarify that idea. Right, right. Mm. That's a much more basic way of, of saying uh, all that long-winded stuff that I've just been talking about, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, why didn't you so, talk about cats, Phil? <laughs> well, I, I was going to, but <laughs> but this guy's article kind of uh, came up before the cats. distracted you, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Another physicist, R.C. Henry, who's the professor of, of physics, of the physics and astronomy at John Hopkins University, he was saying that a fundamental conclusion of new physics also acknowledges that the observer creates the reality. So as observers, we are personally involved with the creation of our own reality. So physicists are being forced to admit that the universe is a mental construction, not a, uh, a sort of physical or mechanical one. And even pioneering physicist Sir James Jeans wrote, the stream of knowledge is headed towards a non-mechanical reality. The universe begins to look more like a great thought than like a great machine. Mind no longer appears to be an accidental intruder into the realm of matter, we ought rather to hail it as the creator and governor of the realm of matter. So get over it, he said, and accept the inarguable conclusion. The universe is immaterial, mental and spiritual. I thought that was quite a nice sort of quote that, that actually sort of brings together what Golden felt was trying to... Um, trying to put forward as a, as, a, as a possible theory, that this universe is not a physical one. It's not about uh, how matter behaves. It's about how, how our own minds behave, how we are observing the universe itself, how we, how we see life. And that's what creates life itself, the way we see it. And it really does tie in with what uh, you and I were talking about in dreams and manifestation of reality. Um, and yeah. uh, you know, we mentioned David Icke, who, who, who um, obviously talks about some of this stuff. And, and um, I think there's a lot of truth to be said that we want to have one sort of uh, overriding answer to everything. But sometimes things are changing and there's not it's not all, doesn't always work in one way, which we also sort of talked about in the in the dreams episode. Uh, what, what do you th feel about that, Anthony? Um, in terms of the universe not being a material place, I I kind of I think there is a there's a metaphorical truth to that. But I think there are certain kind of literal features of the universe that are, you know, that are definitely material. <laughs> um, I mean, you know, I'm sitting on a chair now and and if there was no chair here, like I would fall to the floor. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> um, but yeah, I know what you mean that because um, I've sometimes I've tried to understand sometimes what David Icke's talking about because um, he says much the same thing that it's not real. And that well, and I thought, well, if you bang your head against the corner of a um a table it certainly feels real you know yeah but it depends but i suppose it depends on how much power you are willing to give the mind to to make up its surroundings and and how much motivation like are we motivated that much to to kind of create an entire universe for for ourselves um if so why are we doing that um that so i i think it's a i i think it's a very interesting area but i i will i will say this um 
Phil, when you were talking, it reminded me of um, biological studies into into various species. And um, you know, for example, um, we know that there's a there's a spectrum of light, and we can see a certain section of that spectrum, right? And there are other sections, other colours, for example, outside the the part that we can see. Um, so there are creatures walking around who see uh, things that are invisible to us, right? Likewise, there are creatures walking around who, which have different senses to us. You know, the, the one one that um, is often quoted is the Jacobson's organ, which a lot of reptiles have. That's a completely different sense. It's difficult to actually for us to actually understand what what that's like um, because. It's not smell, it's not taste, it's not sight, and so on. It's, it's a whole other sense, a whole other way of seeing the world. And that means that these creatures, you, you, you could argue, these creatures actually do live in a different world because our, our experience of the world is mediated by our senses. So if we don't have a sense to perceive it, we simply don't, don't see that it exists. So, yeah, I, I don't know. That, it, it just reminded me of that while you were, while you were talking. Perhaps that's mm. something similar to what these theories are getting at. Do you think so? Yeah, certainly in a way. And if you think about it, the same could be said of each human being. Like, I'm not going to be seeing the world in exactly the same way as, as you two are. Mm-hmm. Like, they'll be, they'll be quite subtle, but sometimes very, very important sort of changes in the way I'm, I'm experiencing, uh, the same sort of object that I'm looking at or that you guys might be looking at at the same time. And it's going to make my, yeah, my whole experience of, of the world and the universe just slightly different and it and that might be due to various different belief systems that i have or just the way just my perception the differences in my perception of uh of these objects yeah and sure. it's interesting you were talking you were talking before about uh this the, the chair you were sitting on for example and yes there's a solidity to it so the universe definitely is like a uh, a material place there's there's definitely matter in in the universe mm-hmm. but physicists are now sort of saying that they know that almost all matter is empty space is mostly empty space mm-hmm. and uh, and that there's very little solid matter inside it what gives it its solid characteristics is the ele- electromagnetic fields between the objects so between the electrons within a uh, an atom for example and um, between all the other smaller particles within that electron so it seems like while it, while everything that has this appearance of solidity uh, what's actually the only the only sort of reality there within that solidity is is en- energy energy in different forms energy vibrating at different frequencies and, and that kind of thing so that kind of adds just something extra to to what you were saying and and to to what these uh, these guys are, are, are creating in their theoretical exploration i guess and one thing i wanted to say was um a lot of people criticized david ike uh, for some of his uh, things he said you know um over the years but it does seem to me that a lot of what he says um turns out that scientists later on kind of agree with him at least in some aspects so i think he should be given a lot of credit really for some of the things he's he's talked to and talked about and brought up because while he may go off much deeper into it to it to a level where some people might disagree it does seem to be that science uh, some of these scientists should should actually acknowledge the fact that he's he brought this up a long time ago and the other thing i wanted mm. to say was um I saw recently that IKEA are now introducing this idea where instead of um, buying furniture and then bringing it home and, and then seeing what it looks like in your room, you can sort of um, download it from a catalogue online and then look through glasses and see it in your room and see how it would look or even look at a, a sort of virtual reality uh, version of your room and uh, put the furniture in it. And I, and I thought all this technology is, is things are going to go crazy in the, in the coming years. I think, you know, we're going to we could literally live in rooms that are virtual reality where we don't need to go out and buy furniture, where we could be actually sitting on a box. But visually to us, it looks like um, it looks like something completely different. It's color coordinated to our rooms and things like that. So I think things could get pretty crazy, you know. That is actually a really good point, and and yeah, go to the, the a perfect match with my point about the chair. Well done, <laughs> um, because yeah, if you think of it like if you think of it like that, technology can certainly help us imagine something that isn't there, or 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 put a form to something which kind of comes from our mind. So I suppose uh, at at the moment we haven't reached the point where technology is smarter than than the human mind. So we have to reason that if a piece of technology can help us do that, then we can also do it ourselves. Yeah, 
Yeah, true, true. So just to wrap this this sort of subject area up, I guess um, it was interesting hearing all your, your, your views about this. The last thing I wanted to say about it was uh, uh, kind of reiterating what a guy called Bruce Lipton, who's a, a microbiologist, um, discussed. And he, he was talking about how cells work very differently than human body cells work very differently than we expected, um, saying that before we believed that the cell nucleus which contains the DNA is the brain of the cell and controls the cell functions. He's saying this is completely wrong and that it's actually proteins that control the functions of a cell um, and the brain of the cell is actually just the skin, the membrane. In the human body the skin is the bridge between the environment and you and the brain of the cell is the structure that controls the signals which tell the cell what to do in response to the environment. The nucleus is actually just the reproductive or organ of that cell. So this was interesting and kind of links in with what I was saying, because it's he, what he's talking about, what he's getting, uh, what he's getting to is um, that it's belief systems. It's the belief uh, that creates our reality. It's the it's what the the beliefs inside your subconscious, for example, uh, are telling all the cells of your body to respond to the environment around you. And in the same way, what Goldenfeld was actually getting at is that it's the, the belief systems of people, the way they perceive uh, their life, the way they perceive the world around us, that actually creates the world as we, as we kind of pass through it. So all of this is kind of, the more people are talking about this kind of thing, this kind of stuff, the more we talk about uh, the possibilities available in life around us, the more these possibilities sort of become a part of our reality. And uh, I just find this a, a fascinating sort of subject area because it means that the universe around us is not this sort of um, concrete uh, object. It's actually a moldable, it has a moldable kind of plasticity, very similar to the plasticity in uh, the human brain, for example. So if there's anything, anything else you guys want to sort of comment on that? I just wanted to mention that um, I, saw, I saw another article as well, which I won't talk about too much, but... Um the article was entitled, Can Humans Subconsciously Predict the Future? And it was kind of saying that although we might not be aware of something that's just about to happen consciously, subconsciously we, we might, and there's been experiments that seem to indicate that. I just think there's, there's so much more that we, we've got to learn about yeah, the, the things that the human body and, and how we at, react with the universe. And it's, things could get pretty interesting soon, I think, over the, the coming uh, centuries and decades. You know. Well, I very much agree. Mm. I think, mm. um, I, I mean, it's, it's been said before, um, but, uh, but I think it's true that the 20th century was the century of physics and the 21st century uh, is going to be the century of biology. Um, because all of these things that are now happening now, that are, that are happening at the moment, they are as revolutionary in terms of our understanding of our own biology and what's happening inside us as um, something like the theory of relativity was, which, you know, kicked off the 20th century. So, yeah, I, I agree. I think things are going to get extremely interesting. Excuse the pun, but that was a relatively good way to end that topic. And I think you, you're going to be talking about puns now. I certainly am, Scott. <laughs> that was a, a, a segue of unrivaled beauty, let me say. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> one of my one of my favourite things to to bring up on the show is um, unusual mental disorders, and uh, I, I wanted to mention a story that cropped up on the on BBC Science last month called uh, "The Curse of the People Who Can't Stop Making Puns," and uh, it's about a recent case of Witzelsucht which is a, a rare neurological disorder uh, which results from uh, damage to part of the brain's frontal lobe called the orbitofrontal cortex. And Why do they always come up with such long words that nobody can pronounce? Um, I think because most of the short words are taken. <laughs> okay. So, um, one symptom of this disease, um, as it says in the, in the title of the, the BBC piece, is that patients develop a, a, a mania for puns and bad humor they literally cannot stop producing this stuff and so the article was a case study of a guy named Derek who had a stroke and uh, a stroke is a is a common trigger for Witzelsucht and he used to wake his wife up at night to to tell her these absolutely awful jokes that were just whizzing around in his head the whole time and um <laughs> but um eventually just to try and stop him from doing that she convinced him to 
start writing down any puns or, or, or jokes that came to him. So then he sat down and wrote about 50 pages of these things over the next few days, which, which shows you just how much stuff was flying around his brain. Um, but listen, before I go any further with this, um, tell me if you know the end of this joke. Um, there are three guys stranded on a desert island, and they find a lantern with a genie inside. The genie grants each of them one wish, and the first guy says, can you continue from here? Uh, I, can, I, I know the end of the joke. Ah, okay. Well, shall I give you this part of the joke? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wish the first guy says <laughs> the, the first guy says I wish I wish I was off this island and back home with my family. Yeah. And immediately he just poof vanish, vanishes in a puff of smoke. And the second guy goes, "Wow, it's really true." And so he wishes the same thing and immediately puff of smoke and he's gone. So do you know the end? Yes, I do. The, the last guy says, uh, I, "I'm a bit lonely. I wish I had my friends back with me." <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So now, um, Oxford University researchers have decided that this is one of the best jokes in the world. <laughs> but they're not—they're not, they're not the, uh, the most humorous people themselves, are they? So I mean, they probably find anything funny. And it start and it, I mean, if if you're um, now in mind of the Monty Python funniest joke in the world sketch, I think you're not the only one. <laughs> but um, the reason for that is most jokes are kind of like puzzles, so they they operate through a kind of logical incongruity between the situation and the punchline, but the incongruity has to have its own logic if, if the joke is really going to work. You know, you, you can't say, like, what's brown and sticky? A fish. You have to say a stick, right? So... <laughs> um, I, liked, I liked the first one. It was more um, sort of surreal. <laughs> well, yeah, unless you want to go down the, the, the surrealist path, in which case, yeah, go for the fish every time. <laughs> but um, neuroscience don't... Um, don't fully understand it yet, but, but as far as they can tell, we, we process this joke logic in a little network of regions around our frontal lobes. And if it does work, we then send a signal to the pleasure centers of the frontal lobe, and we get a little dopamine kick from that. So this is why we get the kind of ha-ha reaction. It's this little, little kick of nice chemicals, right? But the interesting part about Witzelsucht is people who have it can only get the dopamine kick from activity which originates inside their own brain. So, so they become addicted to that and they laugh hysterically at the jokes they make themselves, but they completely fail to get anybody else's humour because although their frontal lobe is disinhibited, it's also not functioning properly. So they, they make up these silly jokes, they laugh at them hysterically, but you tell them a joke, they, they blank on you. Now, yeah, this brings up a uh, topic which I know we've <coughs> talked about in the past, which is how some of the things in the past where, um, you know, people were just considered really annoying people and now being given sort of uh, with with studies and now being given names and uh, reasons why these people do these things. So instead of being highly annoying people who laugh at their own jokes, they've been given a, a label and now that they're excused from this behavior. Yeah, you're, abs you're absolutely right. It's something you hear a lot nowadays, yeah, especially in relation to kids. Um, you know, people say things like, oh, when I was at school, you know, we had naughty kids and we had kids who couldn't do maths and so on. And now these kids have all got labels, you know, the naughty kids are a ADHD, the kids who can't do maths have got dyscalculia or mathematics disorder and so on and so on. Um, and, yeah, there, I think there's a, a very important debate to be had about whether or not this is a good thing. Um, but in terms of where this, these... Should we have the debate or for, leave that for another time? Yeah, let's. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Good point. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, actually, that was a kind of that was actually a kind of joke because I've got a compulsive disorder to, to sometimes <laughs> try and joke. This about is it. all becoming quite a comedy sketch in itself. <laughs> <laughs> I can't. Sorry, I was, laugh, I was laughing at my own <laughs> joke there. I mustn't do that. <laughs> so let's let's go back, but go back a step. Um, what do you guys think about this? I sort of have mixed feelings about the the new disorders. That's uh, that that is quite a debate and um and in on the one hand like it's giving us a deeper sort of insight into the workings of uh, the human mind for example and and psychology and and so on and so it gives us a better a better understanding of of um just strangeness in in other people so that we we can be more empathetic and uh, a little bit more to show a bit more consideration but at the same time it's like it, it seems like we have to it, as a, perhaps as a part of our 
need to control. Um, it seems like we have to sort of place some sort of label on every single condition, a bit like what Scott said, you know, every single condition in the, the human sort of field of awareness. Um, and and it just it seems a bit overboard sometimes. It seems like it's it's a little bit too much. I agree. I mean, doesn't it doesn't it really mean that everyone's excused from everything? every kind of negative behavior because surely anyone who does anything and if they do it regularly just make a li- make a list of what they do regularly call it a disorder give it a name and anyone else who does something similar they can have that name as well and then if they do that annoying behavior they can just say well sorry i've got such and such disorder uh, we- we'll give it a long title because we know that the short words are taken so um that seems to be the case although i i have been looking at autism recently and i can kind of i can kind of see both sides of this of the story but i sometimes think that in it's for example in the case of autism sometimes society's reaction to it and the way they deal with a child that is autistic seems like it, it could be far worse than if nothing was done about it in the first place so that that's the only that's the observation i've made so far anyway um, mm. it's, it's very possible. Autism is a very interesting one. Um, I know that you have been, you've had some recent personal experience with it, Scott. And, and yeah, it's some, I, I think a lot of people who do have the feeling that they, they come away with the feeling that, um, these people who have been, who have been diagnosed with a disorder from another perspective, looking at it from, you know, through a different set of lenses, what they have is not a disorder so much as a talent. But it's not a talent which fits easily into our expected range of, you know, conformist behaviour, and so we we go, ooh, that's a bit weird, and and we we try to find a label for it, and the label turns out to be a negative one. Well, yeah, I mean, um, I don't want to talk about a per- any particular personal case, but one of the characteristics of some autistic children is, um, for example, asking questions again and again and again, which is something that small children do. Anyway, you know, um, you know, a lot of parents have experienced that where a child just keeps asking questions to the point where they're told to be quiet. And um, for some autistic people, that's what they do. And um, they're trying to get as much knowledge as possible. But, you know, for society around them, that's not the kind of behavior that that sort of helps you fit in. So it has to be stopped and controlled in some way. So I I was just going to say this is what I find part of the. The, the sort of interest in this subject is is like like is like what you were saying it's a disorder we we label it a disorder only because it's it just goes a little bit beyond the boundaries of what we we find appropriate or acceptable in adult sort of behavior in adult life but it's it's a bit like the what i was saying before we 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 sort of place these controls on everything around us that might appear a little bit strange or a little bit weird that we don't quite know how to deal with it so that we can order or place order on to everything in our society, everything in our world. And the world needs a little bit of chaos. You know, human beings aren't necessarily an ordered sort of um, uh, organism. You know, we have a little bit of chaos in there as well. And that's sort of what makes us a little bit more. It gives us diversity in, in life. And by trying to place order on it, it's like we're we're sort of saying yes to the the sort of um, the system in in the book, the 1984, for example. You know, where everything is kind of ordered and structured and uniformed and and so on. And anything that's just a little bit out of the ordinary um, gets labelled this disorder or there's something wrong with it. And that's what I find really disturbing about you know how how human beings treat these these kinds of things so take adhd for example you know so many young kids are are labeled adhd and and yet really they're just kids you know their minds are just jumping everywhere they're trying to they're just interested in things they're curious and they're not really designed a, a child isn't really designed to sit at a at a desk listening to some adult speaking at the front of a classroom for for hours on end every single day so ADHD, I think, is not really a disorder. It's just you're a child. You're a human, a human child. I, me- I meant to say before, by the way, Scott, um, you mentioned the, the kids who ask why all the time. Um, Russian actually has a word for these kids. <laughs> um, it's a word we really should have in English. When I heard it, I thought, why don't we have that? Um, the, the, Russian word is, uh, the Russian word for why is pachimu, right? Um, then you put a little cutesy ending on that and you come up with the word pachimuchka. 
And that's a child oh, who... Oh, that's very sweet, yeah. It is sweet. <laughs> it's a child who always asks why. <laughs> but in terms of where these disorders are, are, are coming from, I think that's that's interesting to know. And and the answer is um, they're from a book called the DSM, or, or Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. Um, <clears throat> it's the... Uh, it's the manual that virtually all psychiatrists use for diagnostic purposes. It's got like this exhaustive list of conditions and each condition has its own checklist of symptoms. So if these disorders are coming any, coming from anywhere in particular, this is where. Uh, the thing is though, um, this DSM, uh, it started out quite small. Its first edition was something like 65 pages. Yeah. And it was only like, you know, well-known disorders that none of us would dispute, like schizophrenia and things like this. But now it's grown to over 800 pages because more and more things have been added, right? So you, you could argue this is where the, the problem is, is, is coming from. I mean, the, the authors or the editors just went, you know, just went mad. <laughs> Pardon the pun. And, uh, <laughs> and, um, they started just, you know, madly adding all these new conditions and that's what's driving this this ridiculous push to get everything labeled as a disorder and and, and look, could that book end up like to be like 20 volumes long in sort of decades from now you know well i mean at the moment we've just hit dsm5 not so long ago uh and and it's it's large enough that i think if you if you hit someone with it in the right spot you could kill them <laughs> sounds a bit like that at the uh the dmv department for motor vehicles and um the these psychologists are using it for diagnostic tests on human beings you know we we plug all these cars into diagnostic machines for um to work out what's wrong with them and stuff it's uh, yeah interesting little analogy there and it is uh it is um yeah, it's very, I mean, the whole thing about checklists, you know, that's what it is. It's a huge list of checklists. So it is like a lot like, a, as you say, a diagnostic test for your car. Um, but there is actually a, again, there's a, there, there's a reason for that. And it's, it's very interesting to um, kind of tease out a little bit of this book's history. Um, it started expanding at around its third edition um, soon after the editorship was taken over in the 1970s by a guy called Robert Spitzer. And... His story is uh, his story is told really well in the in the John Ronson book, The Psychopath Test. So I'm going to just do a brief retell of John Ronson's version now. Basically, Spitzer was trained as a psychiatrist, but he had a kind of very tragic family life. His mother was chronically depressed, and psychiatrists just couldn't help her. They had no idea why she was so unhappy. So they kept quote unquote sleuthing around her unconscious. Um, kind of analysing her thoughts and dreams and so on. But they, they couldn't come up with anything apart from just wild guesses about what was wrong with her. So, so as a young, as a boy and then a young man, this, this Spitzer, he watched his mother live this terribly unhappy life and then die terribly unhappy. And he just came to hate the psychiatric profession for their uselessness in helping his mum. So, he became a psychiatrist <laughs> and he decided that he was going to do something about this and the, the something was that he would try to take the kind of guesswork out of psychiatry and he would do that by making these lists so that you could you could do this with some degree of precision if your patient's symptoms matched up with a list for a particular disorder then you had your diagnosis you know just take all the mystery out and and find out what's wrong with people so he he held a, a, a long series of editorial meetings, which were apparently like just chaotic fights more than anything. <laughs> and he vastly expanded the book. Uh, and, it, and, and it went from being tiny and obscure, nobody really knew about it prior to that, um, to being huge. And this, this bestseller, like it, it sold millions, not only with psychiatrists, but members of the general public started buying it so they could, you know, take it home and diagnose themselves. <laughs> and I think anyone who sits at, sits at home at night reading these long lists of mental disorders probably has one. There's probably a disorder in, in the book that covers that behaviour, yeah. <laughs> but, but that's actually... Probably on the last page. Uh, yeah. You probably get to the last page of reading it like, oh, damn, I've got one myself. <laughs> Epilogue. <laughs> you are mad if you made it this far. <laughs> But, but that's actually how the, the, that is actually how most of the disorders that you and I have heard of were, were invented is, is in the publication of this book. But what's interesting to me is that Spitzer had, or at least I think he had kind of a good motive for doing it. You know, he wanted to create the conditions in which more people with mental illnesses could be correctly diagnosed, which I think is quite noble. And by the way, he he did actually save the 
profession from a series of scandals that was going through a real low point at the end of the late 60s. Um, there was one, one particular incident uh, or series of incidents called the Rosenhan experiment where eight people uh, went out to mental institutions across the USA and they tried to get themselves committed. And the way they did it, they were all told to act completely normal, normally when they turned up. Yeah? Apart from telling the duty psychiatrist that a voice in their head kept saying the phrase, empty hollow thud. That's the only strange thing they were allowed to say. Apart from that, they just had to behave as they normally would. And in every single case, it worked. In fact, <laughs> some of them couldn't get out of the institutions afterwards. They couldn't convince them that they were sane. <laughs> and <laughs> well, they're still there to this day. <laughs> and then that hit the media <laughs> in the US, and the prestige of the psychiatric profession took a dive. Um, it, it, it hit around the same time as, you know, like stories started coming out about LSD being used in the profession and so on and so on. So, yeah, the, the, the DSM really got the profession out of a hole, but, but unfortunately there are two problems, and I'm sure you'll agree um, that these are problems. Um, first of all, the whole thing became a sort of roller coaster that no one could stop. And, and like I said, DSM-5 is enormous, and now we're hearing, you know, of disorders that don't really seem like disorders at all. <laughs> um, but also, when this all happened, the drug companies saw a massive opportunity. And, and in the last kind of 30 years or so, they've been pushing psychiatrists to diagnose more often. So now you've got vast numbers of kids on medication who shouldn't be. And they, they even push for diagnosis of childhood bipolar disorder, which is in the DSM, or was in DSM-3. Childhood bipolar disorder requires kids to be seriously medicated. And the biggest problem with that is it doesn't exist. <laughs> or at least there's no evidence. There's no evidence that it does. It's one of the few things in the DSM which Spitzer later said he got completely wrong. So it's been a disaster for those kids. Um, I, I think um, any, any of these people that try and uh, make money um, out of uh, drugs by sort of you know utilising or exploiting these these uh, things, are, they should they should face criminal charges in my opinion. Yeah, I absolutely I absolutely agree. And I and I think you know. Uh, um, so there, there is a, a, there are good reasons to be, to be cynical about this profusion of disorders. But, but to, to go right back to the, the Witzelsucht that we, we discussed at the start, the punning disorder. You know, we, I mean, it is, it is kind of funny. It's sort of undeniable that it is, that it is sort of a humorous one to discuss. But in actual fact, and, and it's also one that you would think, yeah, hardly classifies as a mental illness. But the thing is, it's really difficult for for loved ones to live with people who have this condition, you know, it hits them in their 40s or 50s usually, and their friends and spouses just find it incredibly traumatizing. So maybe we need to come up with a better way of dealing with things than 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 finding, you know, a checklist which will tell us which disorder it is. But but perhaps we should also be a little patient with this process and think, all right, well, well, well something has to be done to help these people, and and at the moment we haven't we haven't really got anything better, so it may be better than having nothing. I don't know. Would you agree with that? It would be interesting to just kind of um, have some kind of... Uh, I was going to say, the only words that are coming to, into my head are clown school or <laughs> something like that, where people actually sort of go and, and really look into the, the the nature of comedy and and what is funny and stuff. Because I can imagine how, how difficult it would be to come across someone who just doesn't find your jokes funny, but finds all of these weird sort of puns completely hilarious, which you don't find funny at all. It would be quite difficult to sort of spend a lot, a lot of time in, in, that, in that person's company. But... Um, but we don't ever really look at that's the first I've heard what you were saying, Anthony, about um, how comedy actually works, you know, how the brain sort of processes it. That's the first I've ever heard of it. And it would be interesting to kind of find out and research more more about that kind of thing. So some kind of comedy school would be um, would be uh, perhaps a way forward for that. There's actually a lot of research on on laughter. And, and I would love to talk about that on, a, on another episode because it's, it's very, very interesting and, and quite, quite, um, quite fun to delve into. So let's do that, shall we? Uh, Anthony, we, uh, we only talk about serious issues on uh, Truth Center. Uh, sorry, <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I was thinking... Back, um, back to JFK and the aliens. Huh? <laughs> yeah. no, I was thinking like um, what Phil said earlier about like, um, you know, how people who are different... Um, you know, they don't fit in with society. It's not all, everything needs to be organized. And, you know, even the word disorder, 
It's like, you know, this person has a disorder. They're not fitting in with organ with society. Um, and, 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 you know, what's the solution? Should they be segregated? You know, if, in some ways it could be a talent that they've got. It could be something that's that could be harnessed. You know, if someone's telling puns and jokes all the time, yeah, write a book. But but it's not it doesn't you know, it's not comfortable for the person that has to live with them. But segregation mm. as well is also difficult <clears throat> because if you set, start separating people from other people, then. You know, you've got other factors to deal with. You know, is it right to do that? So it's a, it's a difficult issue. But I wanted to finish today, um, as we've run out of time, just to, by mentioning a, another kind of mania. Um, you know, in some ways, madness and uh, hysteria can happen to not just individuals, but groups as well. And there was a, a recent article um, about a school in Malaysia that had to shut down tempor temporarily to um, handle a case of mass hysteria. And it happened um, in a school in the city of Kotabaru. Um, and the, the children believe there, there had been some kind of supernatural experience there, a sort of a dark figure, um, an apparition that they believed had appeared. And it was um, it started spreading the, the news and uh, and uh, they, they, everyone was getting freaked out and um, people believed they were being possessed. And, it, and uh, there was a kind of hysteria uh, and craziness that, that broke out and they had to close the school down and religious leaders came in and, uh, you know, there was exorcisms and, um, you know, but some sociologists have said that this is, this was just a classic case of mass hysteria. And there was a, a guy called Robert Bartholomew um, who I've actually asked if he could come on on the show and maybe talk about this. Uh, so we'll wait and hear uh, if he responds. But um, he's saying that these kind of outbreaks usually occur in small uh, tight-knit groups um, in, and in rural areas uh, where, you know, uh, m maybe there's problems and, uh, and stresses that build up and then one person kind of reacts to something they've seen and then others kind of, as a release, kind of agree that they've seen the same thing or they, they've seen something similar and it kind of spreads and it gets out of control. I just thought it was a, an interesting story. That is a really Remind me of the Salem witch trials several hundred years ago in America. The this same sort of thing happened, basically, the, the history books kind of record one person sort of uh, making a uh, an accusation that one of the residents of this small town of Salem uh, was a witch, and suddenly everyone starts seeing witches, and they they people concluded, basically, that there was mass hysteria going on then, and um, all caused by a single sort of catalyst of one one um, one accusation. And I think it does happen, I think. Uh, but at the same time, we have to be open minded to think to to accept that some sometimes people are telling the truth. So, again, it's a difficult situation. Yeah, I was going to um, uh, I was going to uh, mention. Sorry, sorry. You go <laughs> ahead. Okay. Oh, um, <laughs> absolutely. You're absolutely right, I think. And, and I, I wanted to just res respond to that because it's such such an interesting coincidence that you mentioned that uh, and we were just talking about laughter research before some of the laughter research uh, that has been done was based on an, a laughter epidemic which broke out in 1962 in Tanzania in a village, in a kind of close-knit village. Uh, a few school students started laughing and couldn't stop and it spread and then they had to close down the school where it happened, <laughs> send all the kids home and they <laughs> took the laughter back to their villages with them and then those villages started to laugh uncontrollably and it, it affected over 1,000 people and it was diagnosed as mass psychogenic illness. Isn't that bizarre? And now they're all wow. cra craving for it to come back again. Yeah, they probably are. <laughs> As they're all moping around looking at the floor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so the, the, I thought I'd finish just uh, the last couple of minutes. Um, I was going to talk about, uh, you know, many, people, many listeners have probably heard about the um, Microsoft apology for the online AI bot that kind of went out of control and started becoming a, a Holocaust-denying racist because it was being sort of, uh, uh, it was responding to uh, input from uh, users on on social media. Are you talking and about? Also, uh, are you talking about Donald Trump now? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not actually. Although you know, there are some comparisons to humans, and and the other story was um, the, and I know you know a little bit about this one, Anthony. The uh, the robot that uh, on a TV show said she was. Uh, going to destroy the whole human race when she was kind of prompted by her creator and it is a kind of worrying development i think that we've got these ai bots and and robots and of course they're going to come together and 
the kind of input they're going to get is from human beings, and that uh, just slightly concerns me that some of the negative aspects of humanity are going to reveal themselves in robots who kind of only think in a black and white way. And I just wonder whether we're going to get to the situation once we have robots sort of living amongst us, um, where you sort of joke to your robot, talking of jokes again, uh, you know, you, you joke to your robot, oh, I wish we could kill Mrs. Miggins next door, you know, as a kind of joke. And then you come back the next day and the robot's gone and done it because they only think in a kind of black and white way the, the, because that's the way they've been programmed to um, absorb human comments, you know. <laughs> wasn't that robot supposed to have wasn't that a black humor kind of joke it was sort of like a the 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 designer's um way of of showing demonstrating that the robot could make a joke no no i don't think i don't going to destroy was. the whole world no i don't think it was. No? i think it was a black humor joke by the creator but the response oh, from the robot was literal oh i see i see oh well that is something to be worried about i guess yeah, but don't worry too much, Phil. Uh, <laughs> not going to happen tomorrow. In your lifetime, I, I shouldn't have brought it up. I, I I, I've been stifling laughter ever ever since you mentioned Mrs. Miggins next door. Just imagining coming <laughs> yeah, in. Yeah, oh sorry. my God, Mrs. <laughs> Miggins! <laughs> the robot got and killed Mrs. Miggins. And um, unless any, unless you guys have got anything else to add, I thought we'd probably uh, end it there. I just think we should um, enti on, ent entitle this episode The Robot That Killed Mrs. Miggins. That's all. Right. That's the only thing I have to add. <laughs> I don't know how many people would click on that, but maybe they would. Yeah. But, Phil, you, you wanted to say something about polar bears, I think, before we totally end. I, I could just add a couple of articles, news articles. Shall I, mm -hmm. shall yeah. I do that? Mm -hmm. So three, three different articles that I, I came across that I found quite interesting. One is on uh, the mysteriousuniverse.org site, and it's talking about black market brain implants. A guy called Zoltan Istvan Giorko, I'm not sure if that's the way to pronounce his name, but the best, best I could, uh, was, was talking about um, certain presidential candidates coming to the US to have some implants placed into their brain. And he was saying that this is the beginning of the hive mind where everyone is interconnected to one another. So if you're interested in reading up on brain implants, go to mysteriousuniverse.org. And then Hillary Clinton. I definitely Hillary will. Clinton was... Um, Bill, <laughs> you, uh, okay. you mean um, Bill? You mean Hillary Clinton? Hillary Clinton, okay, <clears throat> is, um, uh, appears to have an open mind when it comes to the possibility of alien life, saying that uh, Earth may have been visited by alien life forms already, and she intends to investigate UFOs comprehensively. Good. And then Let's I found an interesting. They're on a spaceship, and she can go off and, and try and find them. I've heard this too. She, I, he I heard that she was gonna, um, yeah, that that she had made some promise sometime in the past that she would open the Area 51 files or something. Is that right? I'm not sure. I haven't read enough into it, but mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I just she just seemed to, if she got into power, I guess she would she would open some um some more of the the more secret documents, I guess, or, or something. Wow. But um, I just found that interesting that one of the leaders would talk openly about that during a. And don't vote for Hillary Clinton. <laughs> and then the last article was just, I just found it amazing that someone could actually write about this. And it was entitled, Aliens May Be Polar Bear Sized. And uh, the, the following comments were, how big and powerful would aliens be compared to humans? The answer that we can currently give is, of course, limited because we haven't found any evidence for ET life yet. But a little statistics knowledge suggests that we may be way underestimating a typical alien stature. Now, see more at www.space.com. I, I, I just I found that a bit laughable that statistics knowledge might suggest we might be underestimating a typical alien stature. But, um, but yeah, one in one in three statistics have been proven to be complete utter rubbish. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It might be more than that, to be honest. But anyway, thanks for thanks for um, joining us today. Uh, it's been it's been a really nice, uh, nice chat. And uh, we've learned hopefully a few things. Or if we haven't, then um, we've we'll always got next episode. <laughs> we do indeed. Thanks, guys. Good to, to talk to you both and uh, good to be on the program again. Yeah, thank, yeah thanks great. a lot, Phil. Thanks, Scott. Bye. Catch you later. Bye-bye. Cheerio. Thanks for listening to today's episode. I hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget you can always um, add articles to our chat room and we'll discuss those on an episode. 
go to www.truthsentinel.co.uk. But also listen to us on the digital networks, which you can find at the bottom of the uh, website, www.truthsentinel.co.uk. I remember also that um, you can uh, buy T-shirts on there at uh, www.truthtshirts.com. Use the code TRUTH1 to get your special Truth Sentinel discount of 10%, and we get a small donation. By the way, it'd be great to hear from you. Uh, drop us a line at scottsentinel9 at gmail.com. If you're a listener to the show and you appreciate what we do, or if you'd like to suggest some improvements, um, please feel free, scottsentinel9 at gmail.com. If you'd like to contribute in any way, you can also um, email us. And if you want to advertise something, get in touch. Next episode will be Dreams and Manifesting Reality with Rosemary Ellen Guiley and Phil Gardner will be back as well to comment on that topic. What are your thoughts about dreams? What do you think they're about? Have you had any really strange dreams? Write into us, let us know. Also, what do you think about the idea that we can manifest our own reality? I'm a little bit sceptical myself, um, although I've never really put it into practice. I do, I do believe to a certain extent in positive thinking and that we can influence events around us by having a positive attitude towards them but um, I haven't really got into the secret and the laws of attraction so um, if you have uh, I'd be interested to hear from you to know whether you think it works and why. I mean I think it's fair to say that events around us don't occur unless we take some action and uh, if there's something you want then you can take action to influence it to happen but whether you can just use affirmations or just say that it's going to happen, believe it's going to happen and it will. I don't know. I mean, I think belief is a very powerful force. I don't know that it's a force that can guarantee success. It's not an exact science, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And by the way, if you think, well, Scott just seems to be rambling on about nothing in particular at the moment. Well, that could be true. I've got a couple of minutes left of the episode, so I thought I'd just have a chat with you. Um, so I'll just carry on talking about uh, positive thinking as well. We're going to be having a guest on soon to talk about positive thinking. And, and I think he may be suggesting that positive thinking is not all it's cracked out to be. We may also discuss motivation, how to motivate yourself to do something that maybe you've been putting off for some time or something you really want to do, uh, but you just need that spark. Sometimes we need someone to give us a bit of a push or someone to give us a speech a bit like they do in um, half-time in football matches or sports, other sporting events. There's so many people around the world that um, aren't really living their life to their full potential and they're not doing the things that they really want to do. And um, I think sometimes we need to just do it, of course, but it's easier said than done. I remember a book I read when I was younger called uh, The Dice Man. Let me know if you've ever read that book, but basically the principle is you write down a list of six things one of them being something you've been putting off for a long, long time that you'd really like to do. And you have to commit to doing whatever the dice rolls um, out of those six options. So if you roll and it lands on the one that, um, that um, you've been putting off for a long time, then you just have to do it. Why not give it a go now? Write down six things, a few of them being things that you've been putting off for a long, long time. Some of them being things you want to do, and maybe some of them being things that you're not so keen on doing and um, roll the dice and you have to obey the dice give it a try now and let me know how you get on maybe give yourself one option where you don't have to do anything you can just relax anyway that's enough from me thanks for listening have a good week goodbye mm-hmm.